Book of Mark, chapter 9, this morning. Mark, chapter 9. What to do when you hit a wall? What to do when you hit a wall? Beginning in verse 17, one of the crowd answered Jesus, Teacher, I brought you my son possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground and he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and stiffens out. I told your disciples to cast it out and they could not do it. And he answered them and said, Oh, unbelieving generation, how long Shall I be with you? And how long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into into a convulsion. uh, And falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. And he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It has often thrown him both into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe. Help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter him again. And after crying out and throwing him into terrible convulsions, it came out. And the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him up, and he got up. And he came into his house, and when he came into the house, his disciples began questioning him privately. Why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. Matthew's account in Matthew 17, Jesus says, This kind cannot come out by anything but prayer and fasting. Have you ever hit a wall? Your children are growing, they're doing well, uh, you, you've taught them and they're growing up and things are going well and suddenly, suddenly they decide that you just, the stuff that you've taught them, the way that you've lived, it just doesn't work anymore for them and they just take this sharp turn and walk away from you and walk away from everything that they know and they get in trouble and they get messed up and try as you might to bring them back. Everything that you say, everything that you do, everything that's worked in the past with them just does not work anymore. And you hit a wall. And you feel helpless and you don't know what to do. You're going along and you're providing for your family and things are, things are going fine. You're not wealthy by any means, but, but you're making it and things are going. All of a sudden, sickness comes. Layoffs. Your hours get cut in half. And all of a sudden, you hit a financial wall. You can't, there's too much more month left at the end of the money, and you've, you've hit a wall. And you feel so helpless, and you don't know what to do. Maybe you're a young person here, and you're in school, maybe college or high school, and uh, maybe at, at work, and, and you feel like you're a fish trying to swim upstream, and, and the whole The whole place seems like it's against you. And there's so many times when you feel just embarrassed and humiliated because you just don't fit. And the temptations come and the people making fun of you come because you're you're different and and all of that comes against you. And you've you've done everything that you know to do, but but you feel you just can't move forward anymore in your life and you you feel like you hit a wall. It's just not working. It's not working for you. You can hit a wall in your marriage. You can hit a wall in your relationships with other believers. You can even hit a wall in in, in ministry where the things that you've depended on 
and they've worked in the past, and, and it's, it's happened for you before, and, and it just, it seems like all of a sudden you, you hit a wall and you can't do what God's called you to do. You can't be what God's called you to be. You've, you've, you've run into something that's bigger than you are. And try as you might, you just can't break through, and there's no victory, and there seems like there's no answer. Walls come in all kinds of shapes and sizes and ways to people's lives, and it happens all the time. Well, what do you do when you hit a wall? What do you do? Here in our text, a demon had entrenched itself in a young man. This child was demon-possessed. Since childhood, uh, his father told Jesus that the language here suggests that, that when this happened, this son was, was probably a young man and that this had been something that had been going on for a while and that becomes important uh, later on. But the disciples, though they had cast out demons many times before, at this point in, in their walk with the Lord, uh, God had used the disciples. They had cast out demons. They had preached the gospel, and people had come to Christ. They had, uh, they had uh, prayed for people, and God had, had healed people through their ministry. They, they'd already had fruitful ministry, even as the disciples of Jesus. And uh, um, they knew the power of God. But for some reason, with this young man and this demon, they hit a wall. They, they could not cast it out. They couldn't deal with it. I told your disciples to cast it out, the, fa the Father says, and they couldn't do it. Jesus deals with the problem, and then later on, the disciples come to him uh, in the house and just say, Lord, what happened? Well, we've been doing this all along, and why, why weren't we able to cast the demon out this time? Why couldn't we? And they were in a quandary, and they'd hit a wall. Now, as strange as it's going to sound, sometimes there is good reason for us to hit a wall. Sometimes it's okay to hit a wall. Sometimes we need to. Um, sometimes we hit a wall to teach us, or at least to remind us, that victory is only given to those who are walking in a current, living relationship with Jesus Christ. Too often in our lives, we just bank on past success. We function on things that have worked for us before. If it works, don't fix it. How many have ever heard that before? <laughs> and we, we live by that in our personal lives. We, work, we live by that in our spiritual lives. And we get confident in what we've been able to do in the past and the things that have made us successful before and the ways we've experienced. Samson is a great example of that if you read his life. Uh, Samson was a guy who, he was a judge, and he was anointed by the Lord and given power to defeat the Philistines. And over and over again in his life as a judge, God gives him supernatural power, and he's able to, you know, pound, you know, a hundred Philistines and kill a lion with his bare hands, all this kind of stuff. He's just got incredible power, and so much so that he just begins to develop confidence in his power. He knows how to deal with the Philistines. He knows what to do. And he gets involved with a prostitute, and he, he uh, goes through the story. He just becomes confident in himself. And um, even at one point, he is with the prostitute and uh, gets up from there and goes out and lifts up the gates of Gaza. And, brings, and so it's like he's invincible. He can do anything he wants. Finally, it gets towards the end of Samson's life, and... He was so far away from God. His spiritual life had dried up so much. The Philistines attacked. And the Bible says that Samson rose up and said, I will go out and shake myself as I have before. And the Bible says, here's some good King James language for you. And he wist not that the spirit had departed from him. And he got clobbered. He hit a wall. Sometimes it's 
good to hit a wall. Because it's when we run into those times that we realize that maybe we've lost the cutting edge of our life. Maybe our relationship isn't where it needs to be. Victory depends on a current relationship with Jesus. We need fresh oil. We need a daily endowment of the grace and the power and the love of Christ in our lives. Amen? We need that every day. Turn to the person and say, you need that every day. You need it every day. And so sometimes we hit a wall because it's been a long time. Sometimes we hit a wall to keep us from getting into a spiritual rut. Anybody ever been in a rut? How many love to live in ruts? Now, come on, don't, some of you do. Some of you like the rut, you know. Worship can become a rut. It becomes rote. You know, it can be just as loud and boisterous and slobbery and everything, but it can be just as rote as a liturgical everything in Latin. It, it, it doesn't really matter because it's about the heart. It's not about the worshiper. Just so much form and so much motion. Ministry that degenerates into religious activity. No life. Uh, even our personal lives. We can start taking our loved ones for granted. We can tar- start taking our brothers and sisters for granted. And we dry up in terms of our in terms of our, the, the life and the newness and the freshness of our lives, and we get into ruts. These disciples were in a rut. They'd just been doing the same thing, and they knew what to do. They had the formula down. They could, they could get it done. And sometimes hitting a wall just plain wakes us up, just wakes us up, and sometimes we need that. But along with that, when you hit a wall... That's usually the time when you realize that, that, that's when you realize just how much you need Jesus. That this thing isn't going to happen without you, Lord. That's what happened here. I, I love that that's what happened with these guys. When they uh, were helpless against this demon, they didn't become mad and just walk away. They went to the Lord and said, why couldn't we do this? Lord, what, where'd we mess up? What, what happened? And that's a really, really good place to be. If, you hit a, if, you, if you've hit a wall in your life, let that drive you to Jesus. That's the mark of a spiritual man. That's the spark of, a mark of a spiritual woman is that you let your successes and you let your failures drive you to the Lord. You, you go to the Lord and you say, thank you, Lord, for that victory. You go to the Lord and you say, God, why couldn't I? What happened? That's an awesome place to be. Hallelujah. I thank you so much. Where's Deb? Deb, thank you for leading us in just as I am. Man, because that's where it's really at. It, it doesn't, you, you don't have to try to do something that you're not. You just get to him. Amen? You just get to him. So when you hit a wall, sometimes uh, you hit a wall just because you need to get back to Jesus. You need to just get to him. Now, now, it'd be really easy to just expand on those points and close the message because we all, you know, that's, okay, if we could just get that, we'd be okay. You know, then, okay, I get, well, I'm hitting a wall. Okay, thank you, Lord, I'll get to you. But the question that the type of disciples ask, I think, is a very important question and one that we need, to, we need to think about in verse 28 where they say, why could we not drive it out? It's a why question. Why, what happened? Why couldn't we do this? And there are a lot of of factors, and and as you do study on this passage, opinions are all over the map, Uh, and different theologians uh, emphasize different parts of what what happened here and what was said here, Uh, and some of it's important and some of it's maybe not as important, but I think there are some things here that are important. First of all, um, part of the reason why they couldn't do it is because of the condition of their hearts. The condition of their hearts. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew's account, in Matthew 17, 20, he says, it's because of the littleness of your faith. 
For truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. And, and that's, a, that's a critical lesson uh, for you and me, that uh, when we find ourselves hitting a wall, the first thing that we need to do is search our hearts. Lord, is there anything standing between you and me? Because faith is not, is not about uh, some kind of uh, uh, emotional uh, thing that we've driven up. Faith is how much do you trust God? Do you trust God? And are you putting uh, your trust and your faith in him in this situation? And what happens is not that our amount of faith changes. It's that our faith gets blocked by fear, and it gets blocked by worry, and it gets blocked by sin, and it gets blocked by distraction. And, and, and so when we hit a wall, we need to check our hearts and say, Lord, if there's anything between you and me, is if there's anything that is diminishing my trust that you have the power to defeat this demon, God, show that to me. Amen? Lord, whatever it is, if it's an attitude, if it's a fear, if it's something somebody told me, whatever it is that's diminishing my ability to trust you, then God, show that to me. Because here's the deal. Satan is powerful, but Jesus is always more powerful. Amen? Satan is ruthless, and Satan wants to kill and to, dis and to steal, and he's vicious, and he is mean, but he is no match for the Lion of Judah. Amen. Hallelujah. And see, that's faith. See, that's you, you, anything, anything that would hinder you from knowing that in that situation has got to be dealt with. You've got to say, Lord, whatever is blocking that, whatever is blocking that, God, show it to me so that my heart's right. Hallelujah. Some say uh, the disciples couldn't cast the demon out because this particular demon uh, was extraordinarily powerful. It was uh, um, just a little bit bigger than what the disciples had ever dealt with before. Um, they, they say that, uh, the, the ones who talk about that, uh, say, well, it, it, it had possessed this young man since he was a child. And the language uh, indicates that uh, this, this young man is probably maybe even in his 20s now. The son is in his 20s. And so this possession has been going on for many, many, many years. And it's a stronghold in this boy's life. And when a demon is entrenched for so many years, I mean, it's not going to come out just because you walk up and say, get out of here. <laughs> you know, Satan <laughs> is a little bit more obstinate than that. How many found that out? <laughs> so what do, you, what do you mean tell me to go? <laughs> I've, been, I've, I've owned this kid his whole life, and you think I'm going to walk out just because you say walk out? You know, I'm not going to go. Listen, I'm not going to go without a fight. And we need to understand that about the enemy. He's not going to go without a fight. There is uh, not much that's more difficult to break than old entrenched darkness. And that's true. Uh, the prophet Jeremiah hit a wall. Israel had become so comfortable with their idolatry. Uh, they had fallen so far away from God as a nation that in Israel at the time of Jeremiah, evil had become good and good had become evil in terms of the values of the nation. Sound familiar? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. And that's what Jeremiah was dealing with as a prophet. And he says in that, listen to what he says. Can an Ethiopian change the color of his skin? Or a leopard its spots? Neither can you change and do good 
when you are so accustomed to doing evil. There's nothing tougher than old, entrenched darkness. When I think of this, I can't help but think about our own culture. Um, Even our own community. Uh, I feel like our country hit a wall this week. I really do. I think we hit a wall. Um, When I first came to Hutchinson, someone... I wish I could remember who it was, but someone pulled me aside and said, you know, Pastor, McLeod County has uh, more churches per capita than any other county in Minnesota. We're the most churched county in, in, uh, in the state. Isn't that something? How many knew that? Yeah, a lot of you knew that. I didn't know that. I thought, that's interesting. And as I thought about that, I think, Lord, why couldn't we? Why, why couldn't we then? I mean, if that's true, if the light is so bright in McLeod County, if we've got more churches than penguins or whatever, probably a lot more churches than penguins, but... You have to understand how my mind works. <laughs> but if it's that much light, then why are we in the shape we're in? Why are we bound by alcoholism and drugs and meth houses and a divorce rate that's through the roof and prodigals leaving their families and why why couldn't we? What's wrong with us? There's that much light. Why is there so much sterility spiritually? And I just... Uh, I wonder, could it be that our own, that our churches have hit a wall? I mean, I, I don't even think it's a question. Yeah, we've hit a wall big time. We've hit a wall. But what, what can we do about it? Well, I think the condition of our heart is very important. And I think understanding, some of you have talked to me about some of the old entrenched darkness that's, that's here. You've told me stories about things that have happened hundreds of years ago, things uh, about the past of this culture and uh, the abuse of the Native Americans that were here and and just a lot of old stuff. Uh, Some of you have told me things about even even families and the lineage of some of the families in our community and old entrenched art. And it's all great to understand those things, but what do we do about it? Because you can describe the wall all day long, but what are you going to do about the wall? And that's where Jesus is trying to get. And that's where this message is is getting, hopefully. Verse 29, Jesus says, This kind cannot come out by anything but prayer and fasting. Nothing else will work. In the kingdom of God, prayer and fasting is the very first step in true faith. Prayer and fasting is where faith begins. Not not work. Not doing the, the spiritual work. You start by doing the spiritual war. And then you do the spiritual work. And too many of us forget that. We're out doing works. And the Lord says, no, it starts here. It starts with prayer and fasting. It's the foundation upon which miracles are accomplished. Miracles do not happen without prayer and fasting. Uh, These disciples were so confident that they knew what to do. Uh, They'd cast out devils before. They, they, uh, they uh, They had done it all before. It's really interesting when you read both accounts of, of this story, 
that in neither one of them does it say, you know, the, the dad brings the son to the disciples and, and says, can you cast him out? Not, neither account says, and the disciples got on their knees and they sought the Lord and then they stood up and rebuked the devil. It doesn't say that. It just says they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. And I think that's instructive for us, that, that uh, maybe they missed a step. And it's the step that Jesus is trying to bring them to here. And that the power of God comes through prayer and fasting. And the reality is that principalities and powers and rules of darkness that, that bind our lives and our homes and our kids and our communities, they don't move without a fight. They, they're not going to change without a fight. Demonic forces that bind men and women like alcoholism and drug addiction and, and disease and um, cycles of poverty. I, I can take you to people. I know people right here that I pray for every day that, that they, they're in a cycle of poverty. It didn't start with them. They were born into it, and their parents were born into it, and it's this cycle that goes on and on and on, and it just as soon as they begin to move forward in their lives, they shoot themselves in the foot and go right back into that cycle again, and it's a cycle of brokenness, and it's not from God. It's not the way the Lord wants them to live. Depression, lust, anger, seeing these things broken, seeing God come and pour out his spirit, not just on Riverside Church, but on this community. I pray for all the church. I pray for the body of Christ in this town that God would just get a hold of us. Amen? That God would just pour. I just, I want to see Lutherans out winning people for Jesus in the streets. And I want to see Catholics rolling in the aisle on the way down to get communion. I, I want to see God move. I want to see God move among his people. Hallelujah. And, and work. And if we're that churched, then let's do something. <laughs> let's not be hitting a wall. Let's move forward and see what God would do. The reality is that demons don't bend uh, by, uh, they're not afraid of faith in our faith. They're not afraid of faith in our faith. We can have all the faith in our faith we want. They're not afraid of that. They, they're not afraid. They, they don't get worried if, the, if we're all reading the book, you know, three steps on how to cast out a demon. That just doesn't bother them. <laughs> They'll sell you the book. The demons will sell you the book. Here, read the book. No, these, these things aren't removed by this, the arm of the flesh. They are removed through prayer and fasting. I think the disciples would have been much more successful if when that dad had brought that boy, they would have got their, down on their knees with that dad and bathed that kid in prayer. Oh, God, just come. And if they would have set their hearts aside and all their formulas aside and just let God come and work in that situation. Seeking the fresh oil, the clarity of mind, a faith that's clear and centered on Christ. Jesus is saying, do the spiritual battle first. The battle that goes on in here and the battle that goes on in the heavenlies, and then you will see the victory in your sphere of influence. It's huge. One of my heroes is a man who lived back in the fourth century, a desert father. He uh, was a Pentecostal at the time when spirit-filled uh, believers just were unheard of. The, the, the uh, church at that time had become very secular and very political. Um, it, it was headquartered in Constantinople. It was right before the, not right before, but it was uh, about 500 years before the split between what became the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. So it was early on in the history of the church. And... Uh, he was a man who loved God. They called him the golden tongue. His name was John Chrysostom, the golden tongue. And they called him that because he was an amazing preacher. He could just preach, and he was anointed, and hundreds and hundreds of people would come to Christ when he would preach in, in the streets in Constantinople. 
uh, which is Istanbul today in Turkey. Um, Listen to what he had to say about prayer and fasting because I want you to see something here. He said, and, and the language is old. I mean, this guy, you know, this is written about 350, 360 A.D., so it's old. Prayer and fasting is as much as lies in us an imitation of the angels, a contemning of things present, a school of prayer, a nourishment of the soul, a bridle of the mouth, an abatement of the control of the flesh. It mollifies rage. It appeases anger. It calms the tempest of nature. It excites reason. It clears the mind. It disburdens the heart. It chases away night pollutions. I have no idea what night pollutions are, but anyway, you won't have them if you do this. It frees from headache. By fasting, one gets composed behavior, free utterance of his tongue, and right apprehensions of his mind. Well, what's John saying there? He's saying that when you pray and when you fast, what you are doing is you are aligning yourself, body, soul, and spirit. You are aligning yourself with the will and the power of God. Your heart, your mind, your body becomes clear. Your faith becomes what it needs to be so that when you're dealing with whatever you're dealing with, you've, you've got that clarity between you and God. And fasting and prayer is what does that. Been a, you know, over the years, I've gone on extended prayer times and fast times many times. And, and every time I go, I've got this list of things that I, I need from the Lord. These are answers that I need. God, I've got this problem, and I need to know what to do. I've got this question, and I need an answer. I've got, you know, we need to do this, and help me get some guidance for the church, and, you know, yada, yada, and all these list of things. And I'll go pray and fast, and I come home, and I have never, I don't have one answer to anything on my list. <laughs> never. During that time, he never answers those questions. But I've got journals full of, God did this. God said that. God changed this. God let me see this. And I come home and go back to work, and all of a sudden, all those things on my list, I know what to do. I've got the, I see that, I know what to do. I, I, that's already happened before I even got back. All those things. God, it's, it's not about the answered prayer. It's about getting me in line. Hallelujah. And then he can take care of the things that concern my heart. And that's what prayer and fasting does. And, and it gets us there so that we are able to do this spiritual warfare in the authority that we need to be able to do it in. These disciples could not cast out this demon because their lives were out of a line. That's all Jesus is saying. You just, you weren't there. You missed it because you weren't there. And you were trying to act in your own strength. Come back. Come back. These things don't come out by prayer and fasting. What do we do when we hit a wall? Is God talking to you? I, I want so desperately to see your lives blessed. I want to see this county just new churches, new people being saved every week. doesn't matter where. It just it happens. The poor finding jobs, good jobs. Prodigals coming home. Life's changed. Revival hitting our churches. Those old generational sins busted for the last time. And the question that comes is, are you, are, are we willing to pray the price for that kind of revival to happen? Because it doesn't come but by prayer and fasting. And so I want to pray with you. But before I do, I am going to just invite you. I want to invite you to come tonight especially. Would you, 
if, if God's talking to you and you see the need to pray, you see the need to set aside. You've been trying to do stuff in your own strength and it's not working. You've hit a wall. Tonight at 6.30, we get together to pray, and it's a powerful time all the time, but I want you to come and join us. I want us to pray together and see God just begin to move and do some miracles in your life. And beyond that, uh, this coming Friday night, I'm calling us to, to a night of prayer. And uh, from 5 o'clock Friday afternoon until 9 o'clock Saturday morning, we just want to open the sanctuary for people to seek God. We want to have an all-night prayer meeting. <laughs> now, you, I know you guys are busy and you got stuff going on. Maybe you can't come all night, and I don't care. Come when you can, leave when you can. But come. And let's, if we're serious, if we, if, if, maybe I'm nuts. I don't know. Am I nuts? So, turn to the person next to you. This pastor is nuts. No, if, but, if, but maybe I'm not nuts. Maybe this could work. <laughs> Jesus said it. Maybe it could work. I don't know. What do you think, Matt? Yes. Yeah, Matt says yes, yeah, so it's, it'll be all right then if Matt says yes. But if this stuff works, then why don't we try it and see what God will do? Amen? And so uh, Friday we want to open up. I'm looking for 16 people or couples that will just be people who would, would be here for an hour. There will be people coming and going all through those times, but you'd say, you know what, Pastor, I'm going to make sure that I... You don't have to do anything. You don't have to teach or sing a song or anything, but you're just here to just be sure that someone is here each of those 16 hours. And if you can do that, just sign up on that. My wife, you put together a little board over there. You can sign your name on there to let us know that each hour is covered, and I'm going to be here, and other, others will be coming and going, but I want to open that up, and let's pray. And let's, what we're going to do is I'll have a board right here, a cork board. And if you have a family member that is away from God, or you have someone who needs healing, or just maybe you want just prayer for your family, bring a picture of your family, or bring uh, their name or whatever, and you put it on a cork board right here. And we'll pray, and the people who come in will pray for those people and those families and those, those lives. And then right here we'll have a cross. And, and at the foot of this cross we'll have a container that can't be opened. And you can come and bring those personal issues, those problems, those fears, those needs, those sins, whatever it is that you, you know it's blocking your relationship with God and the joy and the life. And you can take that and you can put it at the foot of the cross. Hallelujah. And people are going to pray that those things get dealt with. And right over here, we're going to have a map of our county, this glorious churched county. <laughs> and we're going to pray that it gets real. Amen? If we're that church, then let's get that much God in us, that much Jesus in this county. And we're going to pray and pour over that map and ask the Lord to begin to pour out his spirit in Hector and in Glencoe and in Dassel and in Hutchinson and all around and ask the Lord to do a work. We'll take time on Friday night to just seek the Lord and pray. And if you can fast during that time, then I want you to feel under any compulsion or condemnation. Some folks can't. They, because of diabetes and other things, that's fine. But if you can fast, fast. And just, uh, and just pray with us. I know our youth are in a, in a fasting time right now, and that's awesome. One, one of the young people is fasting from electronics. You believe that? No phone, no video games? No, are you kidding me? Whoa! And there's others fasting. From, one, of them, one of our kids is fasting from Dr. Pepper. I mean, I know people that have Mountain Dew intravenously in this place, you know. And they're saying, uh, and for them it's Dr. Pepper, and they're fasting from I mean, Praise God. If our kids are doing, what's wrong with you grown-ups? You old people, let's go. And so we're going to get together in this church. And, and like I say, our kids are already doing it, and we, we need to get on board and fast and pray and see God work. Hallelujah. Will you stand with me this morning? In, I'm going to pray, and, and our, our prayer ministry teams are going to come, and, and if you have a specific prayer need that you would like to pray, come, and we'll pray for you. And I want to encourage you, please come and write your name down here. Say, Pastor, I'll be here for sure this hour. And let's pray together. <laughs> 
We're going to pray about prayer. Is that all right? (laughs) In fact, let's join hands across our congregation. Let's just join hands. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Spirit of God, Spirit of God. Lord, you know our hearts. And there's not a one of us in this room that doesn't sense, if nothing else, in terms of our country, that we've hit a wall. That the world that we live in calls evil good and good evil. We are like the prophet Jeremiah. And so, Lord, how do you break a demon like that? You said it's all about prayer and fasting. And it's as simple as that, Lord. And so, Father, we come to you as a congregation, as a people, saying, Lord, we're willing to pray. We're willing to pray the price for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit for revival in our church, for revival in our community, for a a, a return to God in our land, for healing in our families, for restoration in homes, for marriages healed, for kids who are away from God coming back to Jesus and coming home. Lord, we're, we're, we're willing, Lord, as a people to pray and ask you to do that work to align our lives with the will and power of God and see your will accomplished on earth as it is in heaven. And so, Father, I ask that you would just come with it. Let the faith in every heart rise up, even now. Let our faith rise up before you, O God, and that our commitment and say, Lord, I'm willing to give to you this time to seek your face and to see victory. I don't want to live hitting a wall. I want that wall to come down. God, do it. God, do it by your spirit through your people. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Let this word find good soil and root in our hearts and not be blown away. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.